question is, are we supposed to speak in tongues in church? Yes. Unless there's an interpretation, obviously. I think most people agree with that. But uh, a lot of times the question is, are we supposed to speak in tongues in church? And this church tends to have more than the more of that than the, the average church in our culture. So I want to answer that question fairly briefly here if I can. 1 Corinthians 14 is the main chapter that's used to say we should not. And I say right in 1 Corinthians 14, it says we can. And it says what we should do it for and what we should not do it for. Amen. So in verse number 4, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. The church. Paul is talking about what is supposed to happen in church in this chapter. He says it in verse five, 4. He says it in verse 5. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, of course, unless there's an interpretation, so that the church may be edified. Verse number 12. Uh, try to excel in gifts that build up the church. Verse number 19, but in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct. And nine different times, verse uh, 23, 26, 28, 34, and 36, nine different times in this one chapter, Paul is saying, this is about what you do when you're in church. Okay? So, the key that unlocks this whole chapter is verse number six. Now, brothers, if I come to you and I speak in tongues, what good will it be to you unless I bring you some revelation, knowledge, prophecy, or word of instruction? From what the Holy Spirit is saying through Paul right there, there is one of the main purposes for church, to bring some revelation, to bring some knowledge, a prophecy or something that God wants said, which that's what prophecy means, or a word of instruction. Those four. Those four is what the church is to be built around, the church service. This is what's supposed to be happening in church. And of course, it doesn't have to be only that, and it doesn't have to be just that 100% of the time. But when you think of church, those four things should be happening in church on a consistent basis. Now go back to the beginning of the verse. Brothers, if I come to you and I speak in tongues, what good will it be to you unless those four things are accomplished? So what he's saying is this. If this morning, instead of me bringing some kind of instruction or revelation or prophecy or, or word from the Lord, uh, some insight, some revelation, some one of those four, I stood up here and I spoke in tongues to you all morning. He said, what good's that? Nobody understands it. Nobody gets it. You can't instruct someone. You can't bring revelation to them. You can't open up the word. You can't bring knowledge. You, you can't bring these things just by speaking in tongues. Now, to understand that, you've got to go back to the Corinthian mindset. The Corinthians thought they were pretty big stuff because they were flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. And they took everything out of, out of the context of we're here to build each other up, and it kind of became about how spiritual they were. Yep, right. History tells us that they were so spiritual that they felt they didn't really need to speak to each other in English when they showed up at church, but they would just speak to each other in tongues. And someone would get up and speak in tongues for 10, 15 minutes. And if you're spiritual enough, you'll get what I just said. <laughs> so that was the direction they were coming from. Okay? Paul said, if you do that, you're not going to be bringing one of the four. Because nobody's going to understand what you're saying. There's not going to be revelation, knowledge, prophecy, or word of instruction. So for that reason, he says, if, if outsiders come in and that's all you have is a service of a bunch of people speaking in tongues, they're going to think you're nuts. Rightfully so. The purpose is to bring revelation, knowledge, prophecy, or word of instruction. That has to be done in a language that everybody understands. 
that is the heart and soul of Paul's points through this entire chapter. And the, like the one verse we just read there in verse number uh, 18 and 19, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Paul was not against speaking in tongues. But in church, I would rather speak five intelligible words, something you understand, to instruct others. See, he's tapping into one of those four things that's supposed to happen in church. Then standing there and giving you 10,000 words in a tongue, and I didn't help you at all. So that is the heart and soul of his entire, entire reasoning through this chapter. So we know he's talking about church. We're supposed to do what builds everybody up in the context of those four things. However, if you go to verse 13, for this reason, anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. Why? For verse reason number 12. He said, for this reason, try to excel in gifts that build up the church. So when you're in a church setting, go with what builds up the church. And uh, anyone who speaks in a tongue, there needs to be interpretation to it. If you're going to do instruction, if you're going to do a, a, a rev, give a revelation, if any of those four things, if you're going to do any of those four things, you can't just do it in tongues. Now, revelation can come with tongues and interpretation. Revelation can come with prophecy. But it's got to be somehow building up the church, okay? For if I pray, verse 14, in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what am I going to do? What's the context he's talking about in this chapter? What am I going to do in church? I will pray with my spirit. Whoa, 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 Paul. I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind, or in other words, what people can understand. I will sing with my spirit. Paul, we're in church. What are you talking about? I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. And then he goes back to his same theme. If you're praising God with your spirit, how can anyone who finds himself among you who does not understand say amen to your thanksgiving? You might be giving thanks well enough, but not everybody's being edified. He says, so you have to use both. He said, I will pray and sing with my spirit, and I will pray and sing with my mind. Not because... I need to pray and sing with my mind for my purposes. I need to do it for those around me who are listening and hearing me. But the point I want you to see is, what do I do? Verse 15. In the church setting, I will pray with my spirit. I will also pray with my mind. I'll sing in the spirit. I will also sing with my mind. Paul is not saying don't do it. He's saying do it the right way. Amen. That's correct. Amen. So let me just, for those of you who can sense the anointing and sense the, the moving of the Holy Spirit, let me just say it this way. Like what happened this morning, like what happened Friday night. If you can sense the Holy Spirit at all, I mean, if you're in tune enough to him to know, yeah, it's the presence of the Lord's heavy here. It was heavy here Friday night. It was heavy here this morning. Okay? If the Holy Spirit is offended with what we're doing, why is he showing up so strongly to support it? There's been a rule of thumb principle I've shared for years after the Lord finally got it through to me, which is this. And the way he shared it with me was a correction. He was, he was, he was rebuking me. <laughs> That's how I learned this principle. Never forgot it. Grew new neurons immediately. It's like, yep, got that one. Because I was raised conservative, old European stock, religious. And we knew how everything was supposed to be done. And we were right on everything because we knew how it should be done. And I was, I was in the ministry and all kinds of things, and we had gone to a different place, a different service, and they were doing things that in my mind was out of order. It's like, yeah, that, I don't think that's God. But I could sense the presence of the Holy Spirit, and he just kept getting heavier and heavier and heavier. 
and this was finally, yeah, I was, I was frustrated because it's like, I don't, you know, what they're doing is just, you know, this is just out of order. And uh, the Holy Spirit asked me this question or made this statement to me. He said, do you sense me here? I said, yep. He said, do you sense how strongly I'm here? I said, yep. He said, if I'm pleased with what they're doing, who are you to criticize? Oops. Okay. So in other words, the Holy Spirit does not support things that he's not happy with. One of the easiest cases of that is just go to a bar and see how heavy the Holy Spirit is in there. There's a spirit in there, but it's not the Holy Spirit in there. He's not anointing what's going on in there because he's not pleased with it. So that's been a rule of thumb ever since that rebuke I've used all my life. Um, I, I measure everything by where's the Holy Spirit? You, know, you, you can be doing everything right, but if the Holy Spirit's not there and it's like, boy, this is really dry, something's wrong, he's not happy. But then there's times that it seems like, yeah, I, I just don't know about this, but man, the power of God is here. If he's okay with it, I need to be okay with it. Yeah. And not be the know-it-all and think that I know more than he knows. Amen? Amen. So there's the scriptural and the personal experience. <laughs> but I will say this. If at any time we get up here and we start saying, I have something for you this morning, I've got a revelation for you, hear it, and boom, we go on for 10, 15, 20 minutes teaching it to you in tongues, we are absolutely wrong. It's out of order. And I can guarantee you, if we did that, the presence of the Holy Spirit would just lift and go. And it wouldn't take five minutes into it. It would feel so dry in here, so naked. 